Hey, welcome into our first edition of Spitting Ludes with Tom Luganbill from ESPN. I'm Lance Taylor from the next round, man. Always fun to talk football with you and really excited about this show. I, I am too. And I think the reason why um, I'm excited about it is it's not always going to be just football, right? You and I love to get into some pop culture, love to dissect television shows and series and movies and all those sorts of things and break down a little football along the way. But uh, I like it because I feel like it's somewhat of a personality driven show. Yeah, look, and uh, Dunaway and Brown love those guys to death, but I'm just amazed at the movies they haven't watched. <laughs> I and know the television they haven't watched. And and I tell myself, like, I would be so excited if I haven't seen like Dunaway hadn't seen heat until this past weekend. And I was Wait, like, the I'm movie just, heat. Yeah. The movie heat. I told him it was probably the best shootout in cinema history. It's up there. And it's also one of those movies that they never show Robert De Niro and Al Pacino's face at the same time on screen. They're on screen at the same time in a couple of scenes. But it's generally one of them's back of the head and the other's their face. I never noticed that because it was, I was so excited. 1995, Michael Mann, I'm a, a, a fan of his films. But oh, yeah. when, when we first heard that De Niro and Al Pacino, who are always linked, obviously, with the Godfather trilogy. But when I heard they were going to have a one-on-one, -on -one, I was so excited about that. It's a great scene. But now that you say that, you're right. Yeah. I don't think both faces are on the camera uh -huh. at the same time. Yeah, it's a pretty cool dynamic that they do with the cameras. And uh, that is one of the greatest heist movies ever, though, man. So good. Yeah. Uh, MyBookie.ag, code next round. They are going to be uh, one of our big sponsors here on Spinning Loose. We'll do this each and every week. MyBookie makes it super simple for you to sign up and play. You bet you win. And they pay. Sign up at MyBookie.ag, promo code TNR, and uh, claim your bonus right there. So let's start. You know, one of the more amazing things last year in college football, I had no expectation for TCU. And yeah. Max Duggan wasn't supposed to even start last year. I liked Max Duggan a couple of years ago. I saw the versatility, uh, saw the leadership, but wasn't even supposed to start last year. Right. And he ends up coming in because of injury, and they have this magical run, and they go on and they play for the national championship. Of course, they got completely destroyed 65-7. to seven. But with all that said, do you see a team outside of the top 25 that could even come close to making a college football playoff run? Outside of the top 25? Oh, gosh. A college football playoff run? I don't know, but I do see a team that I think could be extremely disruptive outside of the top 25 um, out of the ACC, and that's NC State. Um, you know, it's interesting. Earlier on in the summer, Vegas had NC State at six and a half on an over-under, and then they pulled it off the board because whoever set that line is not paying attention to anything. This is a program that's going to you know, win eight, nine games, probably would have gotten off of the 10-game uh, plateau, uh, had the bowl game scenario not got screwed up with UCLA. But the reason why I like them is they're going to be really good on defense. And if you go back and you watch Brennan Armstrong, in his 2020 and 2021 seasons at Virginia. And his offensive coordinator was Robert and I, who went on to Syracuse last year, did some nice things with Garrett Schrader. And now he's gotten hired by NC State. So you're reuniting Robert and I, Brennan Armstrong, and you're talking about a guy in 2021 that might have been the most prolific passer in, in college football that year. And I just believe there's some components that are coming together where all of the talk is about Clemson, all of the talk is about Florida State, maybe Drake May in North Carolina. Pitt's won 20 games over the last two years. But NC State could be a team that could be very intriguing in terms of being a thorn in somebody's side. Yeah, and I'm a big Brennan Armstrong fan. I, you know, I was really surprised year one, Tony Elliott, how that production dipped yeah. down. And the same with Devin Leary. And I know there was an injury there last year, but I thought Devin Leary was going to be outstanding. I had them in the college football playoff last year. And I just wonder if this is going to be a great move for both quarterbacks. Does Brendan yeah. Armstrong, you know, does he thrive going to NC State? And and would you say the same with Devin Leary going to Kentucky? Yeah, it's 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 a great point. And both people are probably in a better place and a better scenario. I think the biggest thing with Devin Leary, and it's very similar to the issues they had with Kentucky, is 
uh, the year before is can he stay healthy? Will Levis had trouble staying healthy consistently. Devin Leary has had trouble playing healthy consistently. And you weren't wrong on your preseason pick last year. When you saw NC State last year playing, they were rolling until he got hurt. Yep. And then that changed. They had to play with MJ Morris, quarterback at NC State, who was just a freshman, um, still had a pretty good year. But, yeah, I, I think both of those teams are going to be improved because of the moves they've made through the transfer portal. You know, to, to ask – if it's not a team or multiple teams out of the top 25, I to answer this question, Lance, I kind of look at about five teams in the Pac-12. Like, there's no question Oregon State could be that team. There's no question Utah could be that team. And there are – the, the, the issue with that league right now with the Pac-12 is nobody is head and shoulders better than anybody else. And so you're going to go into every single game and it's likely going to come down to the last possession of the game. And so, you know, I, I look at SC, I, I see four or five losable games on that schedule. But then I would go up and I'd point at Washington and I'd point at Utah and Oregon. And, and like I mentioned, Oregon State, um, I kind of feel the same way. Yeah, I, I'm excited about the Pac-12 this year. I think in their final year, this might be the best season we've seen in I don't yeah. know how many years of Pac-12 football. Um, but the problem is it might be like the SEC. They cannibalize on each yeah. other. And I could see a lot of 10 and 2s. And I don't know if the Pac-12 has got enough uh, enough sizzle with the committee sure. for a two-loss champion to be able to get in. Yeah, it would have to be, I think, an undefeated or a one-loss uh, scenario. And again, that's based on what happens you know, conference wide with the other conferences. And, 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 you know, the, the other thing that we don't know in all of this, like we don't know who's going to get hurt. We don't know who's going to lose their quarterback for the season. We don't, I mean, I, I always try to remind myself of the 2014 season where in week two, Virginia tech goes up to Columbus and absolutely embarrasses Ohio state in Columbus. Okay. Ohio state was abysmal in the offensive line. And the reason why I remember this so vividly was the next week, East Carolina, whose offensive coordinator was Lincoln Riley, went into Blacksburg and beat Virginia Tech. And our crew had that game. You fast forward to the end of the season, and here's Ohio State on their third quarterback, but they're the hottest team in the country. And they win the national championship. So you just, there's so many things that I think will unfold in the first four to five weeks that will kind of, set everybody on a path right now as per always it's certainly thrown up uh, for grabs uh spitting lugs we're doing this each and every week here uh i'm lance taylor from the next round that is tom luganville from espn it is brought to you by lanceslock.com jump on board all of the winners only 90 bucks for each and every month uh we're going into year nine here eight of the nine years winning years lance i heard you're hot Lock. are you hot on this are you legit yeah, so look, I'm legit. Like last season, I had to pull the numbers for somebody yesterday. 58% in the NFL in the 2022 regular season, 57% in college football. I mean, those are huge numbers. They really are. Now, these are pickums or are these against the spread? Against spread. Yeah, yeah. Pick wow. pickums would be too easy. Yeah. Look at but you. But those money lines, they get they 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 get ridiculous. And and you know, so we've got week zero coming up and we've got Navy. In Notre Dame. And I guess if you're going to get excited about a game this weekend, that would be one of the games. And I'm really interested. We're going to talk year two coaches because that is the year that elite coaches seem to make that jump and make a championship run. Uh, Marcus Freeman's a year two coach. Uh, you know, I really don't know much about him. It seemed like a mixed bag last year in year one under Marcus Freeman. But he's got a quarterback that I absolutely love in Sam Hartman coming in. This guy's got 45 career starts, over 13,000 mm -hmm. career passing yards, 127 total touchdowns. The guy can play. A lot of people give credit to Dave Clawson, which I sure. think is one of the more underrated coaches in college football in that mesh offense. To me, Sam Hartman, going back and looking against Clemson last year, completely lit them up. I mean, this is a quarterback that I think his game can transfer just about anywhere. Do you agree? Yeah, I do. And I saw him a couple of weeks later after that game against Florida State, and he lit them up. And um, he was just really, really good. And he's really steady. And there, there are going to be things when you look at him physically, you're going to say, okay, he doesn't, maybe he doesn't wow you, right? But guess what? Chase Daniel didn't wow you either. And I think sometimes it's about efficiency, effectiveness, confidence, knowing what you're doing, having played a lot, like just sitting back. I was having a conversation with, with EJ Manuel this morning on radio and we were talking about the fact that he didn't play at florida state till his redshirt sophomore year 
And he even admitted to looking back to that and saying, I wouldn't have been ready to play before that. I might have been physically talented enough, but I wasn't ready for it. This guy's played a lot of football, and I don't care what offensive system you're going to take him out of and put him into. That counts for something. I think it's substantial. I will make this argument, though. Devonta Green, A.T. Perry. I'm not so sure Wake Forest over the last three or four years ha- hasn't had better wideouts than Notre Dame has. Yeah, and and so what's, what's the personnel going to be like around him? Well, you know, again, Marcus Freeman in year two. Look, we've seen Nick Saban. We've seen Bob Stoops, uh, Urban Meyer. Year two is Kirby Smart. Very special years. Again, I don't know what to think about Marcus Freeman, but you look at guys like Lincoln Riley. You look at Brian Kelly. I mean, who is this year two coach that could actually win a national championship this year? A year two coach that could win one? Oh, my goodness. I mean, would you put Lincoln Brian Riley? And Kelly? Brian Kelly? Yeah. Yeah. I would, I, and the reason why I would say Brian Kelly is he's got the best team to do it. Like, Kalen DeBoer would be a candidate, but we're not even sure that, you know, which one of those four or five teams in the Pac 12 is going to come out unscathed, if any of them do. But he's certainly a candidate. Did a remarkable job last year um, at Washington. But it's got to be Brian Kelly. I, I think you go from year one to year two, you're subbed in as a staff, and you've got dudes. You've got players across the board, and you're getting Mason Smith back. You have an entirely different version of Jaden Daniels right now than you had a year ago at this time. That changes everything. Um, And to me, Logan Bill, he was the most um, surprising player for me last year just because there was so much inconsistency in the Pac-12. Then he comes into the SEC, and everybody questions outside of SEC speed. He had legitimate SEC speed at the quarterback position. So it's interesting you say that because his freshman year at Arizona State, he was as advertised, highly touted recruit. Everybody wanted him. He goes to ASU. He starts as a freshman, really good. So you're kind of going, whoa, this is an Arizona State team that's got everybody coming back over the next two to three years. And quite honestly, Jaden Daniels regressed. He, he didn't get better. He, he either stayed the same or he regressed. And I had their spring game last year. And it was, you know, at that time, Walker Howard, Miles Brennan, Jaden Daniels, and uh, Garrett Nussmeyer. <clears throat> I came away from those 15 days of spring ball wondering if he was even going to be the starter. So I, I agree with you. He, he has impressed and improved. And I think Mike Denbrock, the offensive coordinator there, did a great job of identifying, okay, here's his strengths. Here's what we need to build around. And then here's some areas that maybe he's not as comfortable in. So guess what? We're going to throw those in the cylinder file, and we're not going to do that stuff. And uh, before you know it, he started unleashing his legs, started getting comfortable. They started to come together as a team. And uh, it it was impressive to watch him mature. You know, we talked about Max Duggan taking over last year and leading TCU to play for a national championship. You know, God forbid something happens to Jaden Daniels, but they're in a good spot with Nussmeyer backing him up, right? Again, really good spot, and for the same reasons I mentioned earlier, the kid hasn't gone anywhere. He's put his nose to the grindstone. He just keeps getting better, keeps working. I think he knows his time is coming. The staff believes in him because they know what he's put in and hasn't hit the transfer portal, hasn't decided to go somewhere else. And when he's had opportunities to play, he's played good. It's limited sample size, but um, I, I think they're actually in a really good spot. They know what they have with him if that were to happen and he were to have to play. Uh, this is Spittin' Lugs with Tom Luganville from ESPN. I'm Lance Taylor from the next round. It's brought to you by mybookie.ag. Jump on board. Get signed up before the season starts. Use that code next round to secure that first deposit bonus of up to $1,000. Another second-year coach. I mean, in year one, Lincoln Riley was able to win 11 games. He had a Heisman Trophy winning quarterback in Caleb Williams. Mm-hmm. And the defense was awful. And I like Alex Grinch. But for whatever reason, that team was undisciplined. They couldn't tackle Uh, They really got exposed against Utah in the Pac-12 championship game against Tulane in the bowl game. But you bring in guys like Barry Alexander, you bring in Mason Cobb. This defense, I'm not saying it's going to be a top 25 defense, Lugs, but it should be much better. I'm in a wait and see mode on that one. Um, This is not, you know, for somebody who grew up on the West Coast, grew up in the old Pac-8, Pac-10, and the WAC, and the Mountain West, and was around it my entire life. I'm accustomed to seeing SC teams be what, you know, we've seen Alabama be and LSU be in Georgia now and Ohio State. Yeah, and, people and not forget, just Pete Carroll's defenses were dominant. Dominant yeah. and with different difference makers, right? SC doesn't have those guys right now. 
they know it. I think they're working really hard to stem the tide and to, you know, with their prowess on the recruiting trail right now and how there seems to be a resurgence and a change of perception of the program. Um, those are all positives in the right direction. But it doesn't change. Mason Cobb's a good football player, played middle linebacker at Oklahoma State last year. Um, is he a difference maker? I don't know, but I know he's a better tackler than what they had before. So, yes, let's see improvement there. Kalen Bullock, the safety. Um, I would say he was the only other NFL caliber player in their two deep that I saw last year um, outside of Tui Pelotu, who got drafted the, the edge rusher. He is a really good player. But this isn't the FC team we've become accustomed to seeing. And I keep going back to this point. And I know it's a hot button topic for everybody, but they're plus 22 in turnover margin, man. That just, it doesn't happen. So if you're going to be that poor on defense, the only way you have the season they had last year is by being plus 22 on, on, on the turnover margin and having, and having Caleb Williams. I mean, it's, you take away those two things. They're not much better than a five and seven, six and six roster, yeah, but absolutely. he is so good. He's unbelievable. And, you know, as of re-recording this yesterday, he came on record and said it's going to be a feel thing on whether or not he goes to the NFL. I find that hard to believe because more than likely he is going to be the number one overall pick. So it would be hard to envision that. But if he did, how good is Malachi Nelson? And this will be the final USC point. And then they did sign this Julian Lewis kid, class of yeah. 2025. And people 2026. swear by him. 2026. Yeah, how about that? Yeah, so just give me a little tidbit on both of those guys. Well, Malachi is very talented, um, physically gifted, as gifted as, you know, outside of Caleb, very few people are that gifted, but he's clearly of the remaining quarterbacks on the board, probably their most talented guy physically. Now, I don't know what his capabilities are yet in terms of making that jump. It's a steep learning curve. Things are sped up. You're being asked to do and know things that you probably didn't even scratch the surface of in, in high school. But I know he's got talent. And I know that he's played at a very, very high level for a number of years at, at the high school level. And then Juju's, um, he's a different cat. Um, as a, in terms of purity as a passer, uh, I think he's probably the best pure thrower that Lincoln has ever had of all of the guys that he's coached, and he's coached some great ones. This is a kid that in 7A Georgia high school football led his team to a state championship as a freshman on varsity. I mean, that, that, that really Trevor Lawrence did that, but it's hard for me to recall anybody else having done it. Might, Kyler might have done it um, there at Allen High School in, in Dallas, but it's rare. And he's just mature beyond, uh, beyond what anybody normally sees at the position. So, again, SC is in a good position right now because they're in the spotlight again. And they're playing well. And, and I'll say this from a quarterback position to recruit the quarterback. I think Lincoln Riley is the best play caller in college football right now. I think he has such a natural feel for it. And you watch him. There's rarely any hesitation. There's no confusion on the sideline. He's on to the next play, regardless of what happened on the previous play. It's boom, 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 boom. So hard to get him out of sync and out of rhythm. So, you know, they got a lot going for him. But like I said, defense is going to have to show significant improvement and, you know, let's just say the likelihood is that, I don't know, you're plus eight next year or this fall, which is still a good number, still a good number in the turnover margin. Are you that much better on defense to overcome the deficiencies that plus 22 gave you? That remains to be seen, in my opinion. Okay, so Julian Lewis, Trevor Lawrence, both as freshmen in high school win state championships, true freshmen in college football this year in 2023. Everybody's talking Caleb Downs up at Alabama. Yeah. Um, you know, around here, people are very familiar with Peter Woods, played at Thompson, now at Clemson. Those are oh, two yeah. names that jump. Talk about those guys a little bit and then some other guys that could be true impact freshmen around college football. Caleb Downs will play and I think be impactful, not because he's physically ready, but maturity from the neck up, he's a different cat. Like he fits in. There's not a Oh my gosh, my eyes are big. Where am I supposed to go to class? What am I, am I supposed to be here? This, it, he just fits, right? And, and there's guys that are like that. Most are, most are not. I think Caden Proctor is going to be a, a, a mainstay in the offensive line at Alabama uh, early on. If he doesn't start, he's going to play a lot. Um, you know, the, the, the freshman at UCLA, Dante Moore, I know that, you know, the Bruins, and that's another team we didn't even talk about in the Pac-12. I mean, they got nine starters back on defense. They they took the um, 
Carson Steele kid, the running back, a tough as nails kid out of Ball State. So they're going to replenish that Zach Charbonnet. And then they get Colin Schley out of Kent State as an upperclassman dual threat quarterback to kind of bolster the room. But yeah, why don't we Don, sleep on UCLA? Because I know, you, know you, you look at Chip Kelly outside of 2020, that program under him has gotten better each yeah. and every year. Now I know it, it the ha- PR yeah. is off to the NFL. But if Dante Moore is the real deal, I don't think Garbers is going to be a long-term solution there. I think Moore is probably no. starting sooner than later. But if he's the real deal, UCLA could be a major factor in, in the Pac-12. No question. And I can tell you he's the most talented player that will be in their quarterback room. How he handles the jump, if he gets to play a lot, or or if he ends up winning the job, will we'll tell the tale. But he's another one. I think Zachariah Branch at SC might be the fastest player on their entire roster as a true freshman, as a return guy and a receiver. Uh, he's going to be really, really good. Uh, Sunterine Perkins, the linebacker at uh, Old Miss, who really is a jack of all trades type guy. He's an edge pass rusher. He's one of those quote unquote edge guys. But uh, man, he is he's really gifted, really, really talented. Uh, the, there are so many guys. I actually just did a piece on this on, on ESPN.com where you're trying to figure out with with true freshmen playing. Right. OK. Well, that generally happens for one of two reasons. You're either devoid of talent at a position or you're devoid of depth or somebody gets hurt. Oftentimes it's hard for a guy to just show up and be head and shoulders better than a junior. And then he just takes over the position. Has it happened? Sure. Does it happen? Yes. But it's, it's kind of rare. So when you're putting together a piece like this, you're trying to look at, okay, where are they thin? Where do they need an upgrade in talent? And you just kind of pick it off from there. I think that there's two players at the University of Texas. Texas loses two great running backs, right? Roshan Johnson and Bijan Robinson. Cedric Baxter, I think, is going to be their bell cow. Um, Jonte Cook and DeAndre Moore, two wide receivers. Cook could be a return man for the Texas Longhorns. So, you know, an influx of talent at the offensive skill, I think, will play significantly uh, at, at Texas. I wouldn't be surprised if we see a little bit of Jackson Arnold, the quarterback uh, at Oklahoma. I know they've got Dylan Gabriel. I think Jackson Arnold is, is a better overall prospect, but again, he hasn't played. So, you know, kind of let's let's sit back and, and, and see how that thing plays out. But, you know, the list goes on and on and on. I mean, what which Joe Milton are we going to see? Because if we see the Joe Milton that we've seen to this point, then we're going to see Nico. Right. I mean, that's just it, that, it's going to happen. And so uh, there, there's always those opportunities out there for guys that are in the two deep and then. They see the field, and sometimes there's no going back. Like Harold Perkins last year, that didn't happen right off the bat. And the next thing you know, it's like, who in the world is this guy? So those things will start happening about midway through the season with some teams too. It's Spitting Lugs with ESPN's Tom Luganville. It's brought to you by our friends at my bookie. Use that code next round. Secure first deposit bonus of up to $1,000. You mentioned Texas, and last year the Big 12 was so interesting because – you had, again, TCU playing for the national championship out of nowhere, but you also had Kansas State winning that conference championship. Yeah. And you go back one full calendar year before, Lugs, and you had Baylor upsetting Oklahoma State. Oklahoma State had a first and goal to go to a college football playoff. So I think seven of the nine teams have won eight-plus games over the last three seasons. And to me, in Texas and Oklahoma's last year, the Big 12 is completely wide open. Would you agree with that? I do agree with that because I think Texas Tech is even going to be more improved. I think Baylor's going to be more improved. And I don't think TCU is going anywhere. Lance, they, I, with what happened in the national championship game notwithstanding, they did one of the best jobs of any team in America in the transfer portal this year. And it kind of got glossed over with what's going on at Colorado and all of the quarterback talk and things of that nature. I mean, they went out and got wideouts. They got a running back. All of their need positions, they went out and replenished. And they've got a quarterback that they already believe in. So, like, for, for me, TCU is going to be a problem again. Um, I don't know what to make of Oklahoma State. Such turmoil at the end of the season. Players just bolting out of there and losing the quarterback, losing an offensive tackle, losing a Mason Cobb. Uh, had some wideouts to part to. They had some really, really good young wide receivers at Oklahoma State. But it, it's interesting. We use that term cannibalizing all the time. We've talked about the Pac-12 and those teams being so similar. And then you look at, at, at the Big 12, it's the same thing. But see, that's kind of the thing that separated TCU a year ago. You go back and you watch TCU's wins. Go back and count how many were on the last play of the game 
over the last possession of the game and how many were on the road. That That's the thing. If, if you win one possession games, last possession, and on the road games, if you're going to have one of those years, you're going to be in the mix, man. And so, like, what team is that going to be? Like, what what team somehow goes into to, uh, Austin, steals one from Texas if Texas decides to do what we've seen Texas do, be very, very good, and then lose to somebody you're not supposed to? Yeah, you know, I, I like your Texas Tech. I think Joe McGuire is a hell of a coach. It's year two for him. Yeah. I think he's building a culture there. Of course, I like Chris Kleiman and his culture. Uh, yeah. But Texas Tech, you know, Tyler Shuck, when healthy, is a good quarterback. And I can't wait to see him play his former team week two against Oregon yeah. when they come to Lubbock. When healthy, though, I think that's the thing that's so concerning with me. It's kind of like Phil Dracovic at, at Boston College. If... <laughs> Can't make the club if you're sitting in the tub. Let's yep. just say that, right? And and you show flashes, but then you take a step back as a football team because you have no model of consistency at the position. So he has to stay healthy. Zach Kitley is one of the biggest risers. Right, He's the next Garrett Riley in terms of the guy that everybody's going to be targeting at the offensive coordinator position. It's interesting. You know, I had one of his games during the COVID year when he was the offensive coordinator at Houston Baptist. And his quarterback was Bailey Zappi. Wow. And then they both went to Western Kentucky together. And Bailey's still in the NFL. And now we've seen Zach Kitley rise too. So they've made all the right moves, I think, so far at, at Texas Tech. I just think there's there's competitive balance top to bottom. But you're going to have to come up. You're going to have to figure out which team. You know, it's just like I go I go back to the Baylor TCU game last year. And you watched how, how TCU won that game. And then you sit back and you look. You're like, man, they won it bunch of games like that and that's hard to duplicate each and every year uh, with tom lugan bill uh from espn this is spitting lugs we do this each and every week on disrupt the media it's brought to you by my bookie again use that code next round secure that first deposit bonus of up to one thousand dollars we said it early in the show we are going to talk talk some uh some movies some entertainment and <laughs> so untold is this new documentary series on netflix and I know you and I talked about the Manziel. We both thought it was okay. Yeah. They've got a four-part series out now, Untold the Swamp King. And this is on the Florida Gators during the Urban Meyer dynasty. And uh, I watched the first three episodes. The third episode was a little shaky for me. It was a little late at night. I'd had a couple of cocktails. <laughs> first two, though, you know, I find it, I find it interesting. Uh, a couple of things. I would assume, we talked about this on the next round earlier today, that the creative control lied in the hands of Tim Tebow and Urban Meyer. You think? Yeah. And, and <laughs> I did find it interesting that Urban Meyer, and look, that's a guy, if he's not your head coach, he's hated by everyone. Sure. Um, but like the mat drills and how he changed the culture, for better or worse, however you consider it, I mean, he was hard-nosed as hell. And I did respect the fact that, uh, boy, he came in and changed things quickly. Well... <sighs> How do I say this somewhat diplomatically? I I came away with the same feeling you did. And watching it unfold, my first thought in my head was, how in the world would you get away with doing that? The, the mat drills were crazy, right? right? Now. And listen, I'm a mat drill guy. I'm all for mat drills. I'm all for gassers. I'm all for suicides. I'm all for everything that it takes at 5.30 in the morning to weed through guys, all right? And and I and I loved how Brandon Siler put, you know, if you were a superstar, he treated you like one. Yeah. You couldn't play with a darn, he treated you like that. And the only yeah. way that was changing is if you became a superstar. And I all I thought about the whole entire time watching it, the whole entire time, was that is 40 to 50 kids entering the transfer portal, if that's today. I mean, really? I mean, it's, just, it's, it's, it's sad. And, it and is it's sad. Like you, you're, you're not, I, I don't know who coaches like that still. I would, I think Saban has probably softened up a little bit. Um, Kirby doesn't seem like he softened at all. No. Um, no. And I, I, so I, I guess Georgia and Alabama are kind of different types of programs where you can maybe still get away with that because you know, if you go there, you're going to win a national championship and you're going to be in the NFL. Well, I, I think the other thing, too, is the practices, the day in and day in practices. It was such a different game then when it came to contact, like day to day contact. 
Now you're trying to limit contact so much, not only for the health of your football team, but concussions, CTE, and all of the things that we've learned and, and seen take place. Uh, you know, we forget that this was 05, 06. And, and when I was watching it, it really kind of, it struck me. That was my first year being hired at ESPN and us trying to develop our player evaluation database. So the 06 class, which was the Tebow class, the uh, Percy Harvin class, and, and the Brandon Spikes, and all those guys. And then you go through to the 08 and, and all of that. Like, I remember all of those guys coming in, and I remember how highly touted they were and how important it was. And they really touch on it with Tim Tebow in the sense that if that doesn't happen, does Urban Meyer last there? This is my personal opinion. Probably so because he's so dang good at player evaluation and he works so hard at recruiting, he probably would have found a way. All right. Well, yeah. And go ahead. I was just going to say, you know, we talked about the uh, butterfly effect. And if if he ends up signing with Mike Shula in Alabama, yeah. you know, I mean, you know, what happens to Urban? Uh, Nick Saban probably never gets an opportunity, at least time wise, at Alabama because Shula yeah. wouldn't have been fired because. He would have had Tim Tebow, and you just you wonder how how different everything in college football is because Kirby Smart came on board with Nick Saban. Would Kirby have had that opportunity? I mean, mm -hmm. college football yeah. completely could have been changed with that one Tim Tebow decision. Yeah, it's like I always say: if if um, if uh, Drew Brees passes a physical at Miami, Nick Saban's never in Alabama. Yeah, right. You're right, and so like. Uh, to me, I, I watched all of that thing kind of unfold and I was I was fascinated by how like there will be people that will there will be snowflakes that will go, oh, my gosh, I can't believe they practice like that. Or I can't believe that their winter workouts are so physical. And they showed somebody that was throwing up in the weight room. Yeah, give me a break. That's how champions are made. That's how that's how tough guys are developed. And Urban Meyer came right out and said he goes. I was trying to get guys to quit. I needed to know who the core nucleus in that foundation was going to be that had the same vision I did. And I thought Brandon Siler was fantastic in how he described a lot of the things in the first two episodes. Again, I haven't seen the third and fourth one. Um, but I, I, I had totally forgot, Lugan, but I was talking to a kid the other day. Um, you know, he was talking about fall camp. And I said, how are two-a-days going? He was like, we don't do two-a-days. Exactly. Exactly. Right. And you're and and like not to I remember I had an old college teammate of mine and he said, have you ever noticed on Instagram, you've got all of these team Instagram posts and they're all showing all these videos of their team and in in uh, fall camp and like everybody's hooting, hollering and like jumping around. Lance, I'll tell you right now, when when I was in fall camp, like there wasn't anybody hooting and hollering. There wasn't anybody hopping around. We were trying to survive. Right. Like, so we exhausted. were trying to wake up in time and not be late right. for the meeting. We were trying to get that two and a half hours. It felt like 15 minutes between the morning and the afternoon practice. And when you were on that field, it was okay. How it was self preservation, right? And it's just such a different approach now. And I'm not, I'm not saying that it's, it, it changes fine and, and, and an approach is fine. But I am saying that I don't think it's wrong to still be hard nosed. I'm not, I'm not saying that you have to abuse people. I'm not saying that, but there's always, I don't know if you've ever seen that meme on, uh, on social media and it shows like Dabo, Saban, and it might be Will Muschamp, somebody else, and they're screaming at somebody. And it basically says, if you really want to be great, get ready for some ass chewings. Right. And it's not an attack. It's not personal. Nobody's disrespecting you. But I think Nick Saban uses the quote. He said, what, what some people see as an attack, other people see as motivation or as, as criticism. And, you know, and, and what type of person are you when that happens to you? You know, it, it, it's funny. We're going to sound like the old guy saying this, but I think it's Scooter Braun, uh, the manager right now, for Demi Lovato and Ariana Grande and Justin Bieber, and they've all fired him. And people are starting to dig, and they're they're trying to figure this out. And somebody said he's just too big of an asshole now, and and people won't put up with that anymore. <laughs> like coming out of the pandemic, people are scared to death to upset anyone because people yeah. don't want to work anymore. They don't want to get yelled at. 
Um, I don't know. I, I've always thought that um, that building a thicker skin by learning from mistakes and being yeah. taught the right way with people that have discipline is the right way to do this. But I think those days are over because of the transfer portal. They are, and it's unfortunate. And, I, and I'll say this, too, is the only way you truly really get away with coaching hard now is if you're winning on the field, if you're competing for championships. And if you're not, then it's going to be over really, really quickly. And, 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 and listen, there's different ways to skin a cat. There's different ways to go about it. And uh, you got to you know push buttons and see how certain people react. And I think it was John Madden that said, you know, you, you can't treat everybody exactly the same, but you can treat everybody fairly. And every situation may dictate that differently. And uh, I think there's some tr there's some truth to that without question. But the, the, those, you know, those who can handle getting yelled at, getting coached hard and realize that it's not intended to disrespect them or to be a personal attack on them are ones that will flourish. And those that have a hard time with that are generally the ones that will pack up their ball and go home. Okay, we're just a few days out from week zero. Uh, everybody's super excited about live action. Uh, the slate's not great, Lugs. No, we know that. No, no. We start off in Dublin with Navy and Notre Dame. I'm interested just to watch Sam Hartman and to watch what Navy is going to become in the post Ken era. Um, you've got Jack State. I guess locally around here, people want to see Jack State hitting D1, taking on UTEP. Uh, yeah. Nighttime, we've got USC fight on, taking on San Jose State. Give me something we'll be talking about this time next week out of week zero, if there is anything. San Jose State covering and how many points did they score? Wow. I think yeah, I mean, everybody's that's... looking at that because San Jose State's not a slouch, okay? Um, they were a play away from being eight and four last year. They've got a returning quarterback that's played a ton of football. And I, I think a lot of – we all know going into the game what SC is going to be on offense. Nobody is questioning that. We're all looking to see if this is truly a college football playoff team and caliber football team, just how much better they need, do they need to be on defense, not just to make the college football playoff, but to win a playoff game, which was something that they could not do while at Oklahoma. And the reason they couldn't do it at Oklahoma is because they didn't have the guys up front to get it done. And the teams they were playing against in the semifinals did. And that's, that's what I will be coming away from this weekend very curious to see how they play on defense. And if you're a USC fan, you would rather see 42 to three than 77 to 28, right? In my opinion, absolutely. Yeah. There's no question about it. And um, you need to see, you know, you need to see pressure on the quarterback. You need to see negative plays, open field tackling, right? Um, getting off the field on third down. All of those I just mentioned were a real task. <laughs> last year for this defense. Okay, I, I, we're, I, I just on the fly, I'm doing this, and I don't know if you can come up with one. I can if you can't, but we'll alternate back and forth. One hidden gem movie somebody ne needs to check out around football this weekend. Hidden gem movie to check out around. Yeah, and if you want me to start it, I can start it, and you can bring us one next week. Yeah, you start it. You start it. Okay. So Danny Bull, I think, is a really good director. Mm -hmm. uh, 28 Days Later, uh, he did the one where a uh, dude got stuck mountain biking. Uh, James Franco, was it 72 hours? Oh, uh, 127 hours. Yeah, 120. Yeah, I shorted him a little bit there. He wished uh, it was 172 <laughs> hours. <laughs> uh, he did Yesterday, did Slumdog Millionaire. Really good director. Yeah. Anyway, there's a, there's a movie called Shallow Grave. Have you ever seen it? I have seen Shallow Grave. Yeah, it's 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 really one of good. those mystery thrillers. Um, it's got a great twist, but Ian McGregor, an early Ian McGregor after train spotting, who Danny also did that. Yeah, film. I think uh Shallow Grave was like 96, 97, but that's one of those that anybody I talk to, they've never seen it. I'm not surprised you've seen it because you and I both watch almost yeah. everything. Uh, but that's that's the one I'll throw out there this week. So I'm always dialed in. I got one for you. I'm always dialed into like kind of what's coming out, right? And a couple of weeks back, I saw this movie called Talk to Me. And I'm like, what is Talk to Me? And so I kind of looked at the brief synopsis and it, and it was like a, a horror thriller type of scenario. It was awesome. And it's been in the theater. There was no advertisement for it. Rotten Tomatoes are sky high. The audience reviews are even higher 
than the Rotten Tomatoes. I haven't heard about it. I mean, right, nobody it? had anybody in it. Uh, no, not anybody yeah. that you that you recognize. It's it's really good in the same way. Do you remember the movie It Follows? Oh yeah, yeah. It's very similar to that. Very similar, same feel, kind of same eeriness, same look and texture to it. But uh, that would be mine for this week from a movie show. Hey, not only will Lugan Bill tell you who's going to be the top quarterback in the 2026 class, Hidden Gem Movies. We'll be doing this each and every week on Spit. Oh, yeah. It's going to be exciting, man. I'm really, really uh, looking forward to this show. Absolutely, man. We're going to have an absolute blast. And by the way, I'm on to a couple of new series that we'll be getting into, too, that we can discuss uh, that have kind of piqued my interest a little bit on my – because what I try to do is on Sunday – and Monday nights is my, I got to step away from football a little bit and I got to take a breather. And that's when I put on something else. So that's what I'm going to be kind of working on as we get to each and every Wednesday this week. Yeah, we'll, we'll be throwing this out to you on Spitting Lugs. It's brought to you by Lanceslock.com. Jump on board, 90 bucks. You get every play, every league. That's 90 bucks per month. We'll have daily packages. Go to Lanceslock.com. You get a free play every single day. Check that out. We're going into year nine. Uh, ESPN's Tom Luganville, Spitting Lugs. We'll do this every week right here on Disrupt the Media.